it's really cool what we're going to be talking about today is fasting, but what's really rather interesting about it is um, about a week ago, Friday or Saturday of last week, I was just really wrestling, uh, seeking the Lord for a word for today, and just was getting nothing, and um, and that's not too uncommon. I've been in a season where it's like the Lord's just not giving me anything until like the last moment, which I really would love for Him to change. Uh, <laughs> but um, Friday or Saturday morning, it, it doesn't change. <laughs> oh boy, um, Friday or Saturday morning in prayer, He just dropped a word in my spirit, and uh, it was on fasting, and um, it kind of touched back to when we talked about abiding a little bit several weeks ago, if you were here for that, Um, and just much like the moment we just had, just had a moment with the Lord, and I was like, man, this is the word, and what was crazy is Sunday was like the next day or so, and I logged online, and sure enough that the title of, of that was prayer and fasting, and I was like, man, that's crazy, so called dad and uh, but at the end of that day and hadn't gotten a chance to listen to the entirety of the message yet and I was just like man I don't know what you talked about on fasting but it's just crazy the Lord just dropped this in my spirit and um and then today I just checked my phone I took some time off from my phone and uh have an accountability group with some guys that we just encourage each other from around the country and they had been fasting all weekend long and I had totally missed it and like so God is definitely doing something about fasting and I just love how he confirms that and uh, we're going to dive into that. And um, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. And so I've compiled it into um, more of a manuscript. And I'm going to stick really, really close by to my notes today so I can uh, carefully deliver these words. And so just bear with me with that. It may be a little different um, than some of you are used to. But I, I believe that the nutrients of, of the, the word will still be enriching. Um, are you down for that? All right, let's pray and let's kick it off. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for just who you are. Just who you are. Like, we're just all struck at your character and nature. You could be anything, but you're good. And you're loving and kind and selfless and all the things we've been singing about. And we just thank you for who you are. And thank you for being here with us in our midst today. Father, remove me. Remove my words. God, glorify yourself and your son. Let the Holy Spirit do what only he can do in the hearts of everyone in this room and one listening online. In Jesus' name, amen. Once in an ancient era, a king had a boulder placed on a roadway. Then he hid himself, watched to see if anyone would take care to remove the huge rock. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers came by and simply walked around it. Many others loudly complained and blamed the king for not keeping the roads clear. After all, they did pay a fair deal of their hard-earned income to the king's taxes. But nevertheless, no one would do anything about getting the stone out of the way. Before much longer, a young peasant came along carrying a heavy load of vegetables. He was on his way to the local market to sell what he had spent a great deal of energy and effort laboring for. However, he was already a little behind and Time was of a critical essence. See, if the man missed the peak hours, he would miss out on providing for his own family. However, upon approaching the boulder, the peasant was taken back. He first thought to himself, you know, not many travel this route, and look, there's a narrow path to squeeze through. And besides, I'm already late to the market. I simply cannot risk any more time to move this obstacle. Just as the peasant lifted his produce and sucked in his belly to squeeze through the narrow way, He had a second thought. What should come of a family who may venture this path with a wounded or elderly member? What should come of them should they be on their way to the very same market, but as their only means of acquiring a meal? He reckoned, stopping to move this boulder may cost me a very great wage, but alas, I'll still have food to eat. However, continuing on without moving this boulder may cause an entire family to go hungry. Upon reaching the other side, the peasant laid down his burden and tried to move the stone to the side of the road. After much pushing and straining, he was weary, for he hadn't seen much success, and the day was passing away. He grew sad, for he had surely lost all his wages at the market and didn't even succeed in his task to move the boulder. He nearly gave up if it hadn't have been that out of the corner of his eye, he saw a young mother approaching with two children, one of which being subject to the arms of its caretaker. Finally, after a great deal of labor, he succeeded. After wishing the small family well, 
he picked up his hefty load of vegetables. And just as he turned to venture back home, having accepted his loss, he noticed a purse lying in the road where the boulder had just been moments earlier. He originally thought the young mom had dropped her purse, but quickly noticed this was no common purse. The royal seal attached to a note was on the inside. In an attempt to identify the owner of the purse, the peasant opened it up. Instead, inside there were many gold coins and a handwritten note from the king indicated that the gold was for the person who would deny themselves long enough to remove the boulder from the roadway. About this time, the king came out from hiding and greeted the peasant and said, because you've done this great thing and showed here today that your character is righteous, you and your family shall never hunger nor fear lack. You will be with me in my kingdom, and I will send you as my representative. For I know now that you care for others more than for your own gain. The peasant learned what many of us may never understand. You stand only to gain when you're willing to lose for the right things. Now, we've been settling into this concept as a church family since the new year on increasing capacity, increasing capacity. And I often wonder if in our journey as maturing citizens of the kingdom, we sometimes get so caught up in what we know to do that we tend to complain about, avoid, or grumble over the obstacles we are presented along the way. But what if sometimes something that appears to be an obstacle is actually an opportunity to move from just being a busy and even fruitful citizen to a purpose-driven representative of the king? What if the obstacle, what if the obstacle is actually an invitation to a greater nearness to the king? I believe one of the greatest keys to increased capacity in kingdom living is found in the discipline of fasting. But I also believe fasting is often perceived as one of the greatest obstacles. We, we may ask ourselves questions like, why do I need to fast? What does it actually accomplish? Or we may reason to ourselves that fasting is just unnecessary or an Old Testament ancient times thing. Perhaps we have all fallen guilty to the claim we would do a fast next week. And next week came, and it went, but fasting was forgotten or just written off as too difficult. Furthermore, I'm convinced that the vast majority of the church today has little idea to what fasting is or how it should be approached and conducted. My prayer today is that by the end of this talk, that you will see fasting in a new and empowering light. How, though, could fasting, which is abstaining from or sacrificing of something valuable or held dear to us result in an increase? Isn't it by nature an act of decreasing? I'd like to spend the next few minutes unpacking for you how God uses fasting to position us for increase. It's important to note, though, before moving on, that the physical act of fasting has no major power in and of itself, just like no other spiritual discipline in itself can do very much at all. Rather, fasting, as with all other disciplines, is how we position ourselves before God so that he can come do his transforming work in us and through us. Richard Foster says it so beautifully. He says, spiritual discipline by themselves can do nothing. They are only a means to get us to the place where something can be done. As we will see today, fasting is a form of pruning, when we prune a branch, we cut something away, but in the act of giving something up, a door is opened for multiplication. By that conclusion, it is at the end of our journey today. To get there, we must start at the beginning where we will allow our rabbi, our teacher, to begin laying for us a foundation. See, behind every behavior, behind every tradition, spiritual discipline, or religious or moral rule, uh, maybe the Torah or what we see a lot of in the Old Testament, behind all of those, there is a value. And this value speaks to us of a kind of character or a kind of person that is desirable to be. Keeping the rules or the traditions in themselves are not what we seek, but rather to become the type of person who exudes the values which lie behind the rules or traditions. So before we talk about fasting, let's allow Jesus to tell us what kind of people fast. 
Let's allow Jesus to lay our foundation by teaching us what kind of people increase in kingdom capacity. Is that okay? First, Jesus teaches us what kind of people increase in the kingdom in his famous Sermon on the Mount, his beatitude portion, Matthew 5, 3. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the way the grammar works here is really important. Jesus is not saying that the the latter is a reward for the former. In other words, if you can be a good boy, be a good girl, and be poor in spirit, I'm going to give you more of the kingdom. That's not exactly what he's saying. Instead, he's in essence saying, happy or blessed are the poor in spirit, for they already possess the kingdom. So I can be happy or blessed in the midst of my poorness because I have already gained the kingdom. Paul tells us that the kingdom is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. And so in some sense, we've gained these attributes of the kingdom, but in another sense, we'll enter its fullness in due time. But what exactly is this poorness of spirit Jesus is talking about? What traits mark the lives of these types of people? Well, to his original audience, it would have been quite obvious that Jesus was referencing the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 66.2 reads like this. For all of those things, which those things are mentioned in verse 1, it's the heavens and the earth and all the wonders and grandness that are within them. The Lord is saying, my hand has made all of those things, and all of those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. In other words, this type of person catches my eye and provokes me to action. On him who is poor... And of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Now, sometimes it's true, Isaiah uses the word poor, and he does refer to one poor of material possessions. But in most cases, um, Isaiah is actually referencing those who are humble and pious. He's referencing those who recognize their need for God, those who recognize their need for His grace, and those who tremble in awe and reverence at his word. Like, and I'm just, even now, I'm still like trembling from that moment of worship. There was that song we said where it opened up, and it was the first time I heard the song. It was just about like all the, the heavens and these things that God made, but I stand in awe. And it's just this moment, I just, I'm literally still shaking over that. And it's these type of Moments, I think, that stir God and move God to where it's like all the heavens and all of the earth, the wonders that are in it, that a human being would stop and tremble at God. That's who catches his eye. God is saying that the person who is humble and contrite, the person who fears the Lord and lives in awe and reverence for him and his word, amaze him and provoke his attention even more than all the wonders his hand has made in both the heavens and on the earth. This is actually mind-blowing. And we spoke the first week of this new year about how God gives grace to the humble and how humility was a critical key to increasing capacity in the kingdom. Now, how, though, does humility connect to fasting? Fasting, now, is the discipline which will soften the hardest of hearts enabling the spirit to transform us into the kind of people Jesus references in his first beatitude. The psalmist says it this way in 69 verses 9 and 10, because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul or humbled myself with fasting, that became my reproach. In the more recent years, the scientific community has begun to accelerate their research on the powerful bodily effects of fasting. There's consistently data emerging that shows fasting can play a key role in seeing medical victories, such as tumor shrinking and diseases reversing. And although modern science is just now catching up, this truth seems to have been known for some time. Matter of fact, Benjamin Franklin once said, the best of all medicines are resting in fasting. I'll take the sheets and pillow part, but the fasting. (laughs) But fasting is not just a means for bodily restoration and healing. It has a greater value to one's life and spirit than its bodily effects. To quote Richard Foster again, he says, 
while the physical aspects of fasting intrigue us, we need to remember that the major work of fasting is in the realm of the spirit. The spiritual discipline of fasting can bring breakthroughs in the heart and mind that will not happen in any other way. It is a means of God's grace for the continuing formation of the human personality, watch this, into the likeness of God or Christ. Dallas Willard, another personal favorite of mine, says beautifully this way, in fasting, we abstain from our ordinary food to some significant degree and for some significant length of time. Like solitude and silence, it is not done to impress God or merit favor, nor is it done because there's anything wrong with food. Rather, it's done that we may consciously experience the direct sustenance of God to our body and our entire person. We are using the keys to access the kingdom. Fasting is one way of seeking and finding the actual kingdom of God present and active in our lives. With that, I'm convinced there's no greater means of increase, both in our own Christ-likeness and in kingdom living, than the practice of fasting, aside from prayer, of course. But with caution, that brings me to my first point, motive. Donald S. Whitney once said, without a purpose, fasting can be a miserable, self-centered experience. <laughs> we can all attest. See, it's true, fasting moves God in a unique way. And it's true, fasting has a way of bringing breakthrough like no other discipline. It's true, fasting has a way of multiplying. But none of these ought to be our aim. Fasting is not a formula to be manipulated or selfishly employed. And fasting isn't a means to reap, but rather it is firstly a means of touching the bridegroom who has been taken away. The benefits we are to seek in a fasting are not the gifts of God, but God himself. John Piper, the legend, says the birthplace of Christian fasting is homesickness for God. The birthplace of Christian fasting is homesickness for God. And if I might add to his quote, God-likeness. It's a homesickness for God-likeness, to desire, to have the urge, to have the character of God formed in us, a homesickness to be like God. You see, not only is fasting key in transforming us into humble people, which is poor in spirit, but it also requires a great deal of humility and mourning to engage in fasting in the first place. It was in Jesus' longest recorded conversation on fasting that he reaffirms what fasting was often birthed out of in the Old Testament. And he teaches that it doesn't change for his disciples today. And that's, that's us. In Matthew 9, 15, the apostle noted, and Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And in that day, they will fast. You see, when the presence of God was near, there's no mourning, thus no fasting. But when the presence of God drifts away and we sense its absence, mourning increases, and so does fasting. Furthermore, the Lord also provoked his people through the prophet Zechariah with this question. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? And let those words ring like cathedral bells in your mind for just a moment. Did you really fast for me? Did you fast so that I might be seen, so that I might be your reward? Did you really fast so that others might see me in your fasting and turn to me? Or did you fast out of religious duty? Did you fast to increase in something? Did you fast for breakthrough? Did you fast for just a response? In other words, did you fast to get what you wanted? Or did you fast to get what I, the Lord, wanted? <coughs> Secondly, but of no less importance, what was it that you wanted from your fast? Was it anything but him and his likeness? John Wesley recenters us in his plea, saying, First, let fasting be done unto the Lord with our eyes singly fixed on him. And let our intention herein be this and this alone, to glorify our Father which is in heaven. 
If God then is our motive and God is the center of our fasting, then our fasting is our worship. Like the prophetess Anna, who we meet in Luke chapter 2, she was an 84-year-old widow who never left the temple but instead served the Lord day and night with fasting and praying. Now, don't lose me here. I'm not suggesting we all quit our jobs and somehow spend our lives consumed in a physical temple fasting and praying. Though that may be for some of us. For the rest of us, I'm actually imploring you to take the temple with you into your workplaces and families and greater society to serve the Lord day and night with fasting and praying. But how, how can this be? If fasting is worship and fasting glorifies God, how does my abstaining from food do either of these things? And to that, I say it's a brilliant question, which brings me to my second point, method. So we've talked about our motive. Now we need to bridge into our method. Fasting food is central to the biblical practice, and in my belief, benefits one greatly to practice with some sense of regularity, and certainly take your health needs into consideration with that. But considering that, the Lord also teaches his prophet on fasting, and it is clear that fasting extends further than the act of refraining from food. As a principle, the act of fasting was rarely centered solely on the practice of abstaining from something. Rather, fast was twofold. We were to abstain from something and then give something to represent the kindness and love of God to another, thus glorifying him and causing another to see his love for them. It is a form of representing the character of God in a way that causes another to draw near to him. Once we have the proper motive, we must translate our motive into our method. How then do we fast? What is a fast that will effectively increase capacity and bring glory to the Father? In other words, how do I fast for the Lord, as in Zechariah? Now, first, let us keep in mind as we move forward that the fast should cause us to increase in hum humility, right, and, and, and poorness of spirit. Jesus taught us poor in spirit to them is the kingdom. So with that in mind, let's draw our attention to uh, a text mild in length written by the prophet Isaiah. We're going to read the entire chapter of chapter 58. Uh, don't, don't have a heart attack. We'll get, we'll get through it. I know it's, it's a lot of scripture, but hang on and, and try maybe even to close your eyes and listen and put yourself in the scenario if it helps. This is God speaking to Isaiah. He says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Here it is. They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of, of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Yet they say, why have we fasted, they say. You have not seen we have afflicted our souls, and you take no notice. How many of you have felt that way sometimes? Yeah, you're approaching God, and you're fasting, and you're doing all the things, but it's silence. In fact, in the day of your fast, this is God speaking in response to that question. In the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I've chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring into your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then, after this kind of a fast, your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. 
Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasures on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Just a little note, I'm not getting into it today, but Sabbath is fasting. Sabbath is a form of fasting, and that's what that last paragraph is about. But though we could spend a number of weeks unpacking the riches of that text, I want to mention four points. First, fasting isn't about abstaining from food alone. Rather, fasting is about giving the food we would have eaten to provide for another, all the while learning that we are sustained not by bread or our own labor, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Additionally, we feast on the fulfillment that comes from doing the will of our Father as Jesus showed us in John chapter 4, 23. In the narrative, we see Jesus in the midst of great hunger ministering to an adulterous woman at the well of Jacob. Upon their return from gathering food, his disciples are surprised to hear Jesus decline their offer for bread. His response was this, I have food you know not of. My food is to do the will of my Father. Fasting, in an ironic way, is feasting. Secondly, to fast isn't just to abstain from something desirable, but also something undesirable. Ambrose and Milan rightly says, Do not limit the benefit of fasting merely to abstinence from food. For a true fast means refraining from evil. Do not let your fasting lead to wrangling and strife. You do not eat meat, but you devour your brother. You abstain from wine, but not from insults. So all the labor of your fast is useless. In our text from Isaiah, we see this very truth unfolding. In the narrative, we have a well-meaning people They seek God daily. They study Torah to know his ways and to live like him. They are a people who did righteous deeds and observed the ordinances of God, yet they fasted out of religious ritual. During their fast, they feasted on pleasures. They exploited their laborers. They fasted with strife and debate in their hearts. They fasted even to manipulate God, to enact revenge, but cloaked it in the term justice. In a profound study, Eugene Carpenter and Philip Comfort write this, fasting as merely an automatic way to get the attention of God was condemned. Moreover, unless the person fasting was keeping faith with the Lord in all other areas of his or her life, that person's fasting was in vain. My third point, fasting is a means of partnering with God to express his kindness and generosity to others. If by refraining from food you feed another, does that not bring God more glory than one merely denying the flesh of food? If by living in simplicity you're able to clothe another or provide another with practical means of transportation, does that fast not glorify the Father and reveal His nature more than you merely living in simplicity in secret? Fasting by its nature is also generosity. Here are the words of Aristides of Athens, the Greek names get me. He says this, if there is a man among them who is poor and in need and they have not an abundance of what is needed, they fast for two or three days so that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. And again, listen to the word of the Lord to Isaiah that we just read. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked that you cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Lastly, as promised, our place of landing. Fasting is pruning. Fasting is an act of removing something from yourself that is of great value with the purpose of another in mind. This act of generous removal creates room for an increase. In the same way that a single branch is pruned and then the next season produces two, three, or even four new fruit-bearing branches, so it is when we fast in this way. Perhaps God is 
asked you to give up half your closet for someone in need. Perhaps another has been asked to give up a week's worth of meals to provide nourishment for a coworker. Maybe yet another has been asked to give away a home to a family in need. With each act of generosity, which is a fast unto the Lord, a branch is pruned. The cut is felt. But in your willingness to prune for God's glory, you've just increased your capacity to produce more fruit in due season. If you were to ask someone who handles plants, they would tell you this, that pruning stimulates growth closest to the cut. Let that marinate. Now, let me be clear before moving into the conclusion here. Fasting should be spirit-led. What it looks like, its length, and its frequencies may vary from time to time. Sometimes it may be a secret fast spawned by a deep longing for God. Another time it may be corporate as we're entering into here. Even another time you may be led to extreme acts of generosity. The goal is to keep our eyes singly fixed on God, no matter what the fast looks like. Have God be the true motive of our fast, and once having entered in, allow the Spirit to conduct what it looks like. I like to land a plane, this plane, with a, a poem by John Chrysostom. And it's probably not going to sound like a poem when I read it, but it, I think it's a poem. <laughs> Do you fast? Give me proof of it by your works. If you see a poor man, take pity on him. If you see a friend being honored, do not envy him. Do not let only your mouth fast, but also the eye and the ear and the feet and the hands and all the members of our body. Let the hands fast by being free of avarice, which is extreme greed or the desire for wealth or material gain. Let the feet fast by ceasing to run after sin. Let the eyes fast by disciplining them not to glare at that which is sinful. Let the ear fast by not listening to evil talk and gossip. Let the mouth fast from foul words and unjust criticism. And if I might add, unkind tones of voice and rudeness and speech towards others. For what good is it if we abstain from birds and fishes, but bite and devour our brothers? May he who came to the world to save sinners strengthen us to complete the fast with humility. May he have mercy on us and save us. In conclusion, fasting is an act birthed from a homesickness for God and his likeness. It is an act that resists the physical appetites that threaten our nearness to God and our ability to live like God. Firstly, our motive for fasting should be for more of God's presence and likeness in our lives. Secondly, our motive should be to glorify the Father in our fast. When we fast, be it food or something else, we ought not just abstain from something, but also bless others by showing the kindness of God both in our deeds and conduct. Fasting is a means in which the Spirit can make our hearts melt like wax, transforming us into poor spirited citizens. And from this place of increased humility comes an increased grace and kingdom living. Can we stand? Father, we love you. We're so grateful for you and your nearness and your presence. We're so grateful that the God of the universe, the creator of the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that's within him, the marvelous wonders, would notice us individually and even here today corporately. We're in awe, God. Just in such awe. God, I just pray that this message would land on good soil. I pray that there would be ears to hear and eyes to see in this room. God, that your spirit would lead us and guide us into our fasting that we would be inspired, perhaps like never before in our spiritual discipline of fasting. God, I ask that by your grace, we would walk in discipline and strength to complete our fast, the fast that you've laid on each of our hearts. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your nearness and your kindness to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.